We're in Alliance, Nebraska. This is probably the worst place that you could ever build this. In the winter, we'll get real high winds, lots of dry cold. I think it averages daytime around 30 degrees Fahrenheit. It'll get down to it. every year we'll have days that are 25 degrees below zero or lower. Wow, it looks like you even have oranges. Yeah, those are Eureka lemons. These are Valencia oranges. They're the juice orange. This one, it's a new type of um, mandarin. That doesn't normally grow in Nebraska. The what? Citrus doesn't normally grow in Nebraska. No, <laughs> no, nowhere near. <laughs> the closest ones would be probably 800 miles in Texas or somewhere. And not a problem? No, no, in fact, they thrive here. We can probably grow the best citrus anywhere in the world at this latitude for size and quality. These are 12 month greenhouses. And we're wasting our sunshine in Nebraska during the winter, we're not growing. And, and we're just wasting all of this underground heat. This is one of the tubes coming out, out of the ground, six inch tubes that go down eight foot deep and out and clear out into the yard. See where that asparagus is back there? It goes out about 90 foot back there and then comes around and goes in. There's seven of them come up on the south side here. We're just using the underground heat. Underground, it stays a certain temperature. It's stable at 52 degrees here. So if you have a stable temperature, you can use that both in winter and summer. Yeah. And this blower here, this sets over seven tubes, six inch tubes that go down eight foot deep. And then when the blower goes on, it just recirculates that air continually. When, and picks up that ground heat. So you're just, the energy you're using is just to circulate the ground? Yeah, it just circulates the, uh, the air underground. It only runs when it's 50 degrees or lower. It draws seven and a third amps is all, and that heats the entire place during the winter. But just about everything we put in grows real well. These are figs here, and they'll put up this first crop. Then in the middle of the summer, they'll put out another crop that's way heavier. Here's some grapes, and those are golden muscat. We've got, I think, nine different varieties of grapes. They're all southern grapes. Northern grapes, they'll grow in here, but they won't fruit. These are uh, Thompson seedless. We're having to learn how to grow grapes because it doesn't work the same here that it does outdoors. So all you did in order to have this planting was to take advantage of the sun and to go a little bit deeper into the ground and to yeah. combine the two things together? Yeah. Everything in the design fits together. You can't do away with any part of it and come up with this efficiency. The sloped back wall, this one's so overgrown now that it doesn't make any difference, but in the new ones, when the sun goes low in uh, winter, that wall will reflect down on the growing beds. You don't get growing rays from the north, so there's no reason to have gla glazing on the north. So we get all of our sun from the south and above. This is all lexan. It's polycarbonate. It's three eighths inch thick, and this is twin wall. It has a little insulation value, not very much. But in the back wall, the, this is the only one that has this open foam. The, all the rest of them have galvanized metal.
These are the little flame grapes, and then too we've got blackberries there. Yeah, there's a pomegranate there. Let's see, are there any fresh blossoms? Here's, here's one, and then here's some more. We can grow local plants, and we can grow tropical plants, but sometimes local plants don't like it as well. This tree is about 24 years old. It'll probably grow for another 100 years or so. When we built the greenhouse was the year I retired from the post office. So this unit's about 24 years old. So you initially had geothermal just for the house? Yeah. When we built the house 45 years ago, we took tubes out through the lawn that are eight foot deep and they just circulate that 52 degree temperature. This is the geothermal tubes for the house. You can tell there's a little indentation. It goes right down through here and then it goes into that patio area, three different points. We found out it worked so well for the house that we could use it for the greenhouse without the heat pump. This one is three and a half years old. It's called a Tango Mandarin. I'll pick that one and see. When we started it, we knew it would work, but we didn't know how well, and we knew that we had to grow something that you couldn't grow here. So that's why we ended up with the citrus, and I think we have 13 different varieties now. Wow. All of them thrive. Most all of the fruit is way bigger than... And um, why is that? What? One fellow that had done work in New Zealand, the only thing he could figure was that it was the latitude. But each, each one of these trees take up an eight-foot circle at the farmer's market price that we get. The tree will average about 125 pounds of fruit a year. And at farmer's market, that eight-foot circle will return $430. And we grow above and below the trees. This greenhouse, this one averages about 80 cents a day year-round for energy. And the new design is way more efficient than this. So. We always think we've gone about as far as we can with the efficiency, but I can see the time when uh, we could grow all of the table citrus on the high plains to take care of this whole area. The average grower in Florida gets 46 cents a pound for oranges. We get 350. Why? Well, they're wholesaling them to a broker, and the broker is selling them to a distributor that they have to truck them from 1,500 miles. The profit that we get off of one tree, they're going to have to have nine trees. People say that the young person can't get into farming anymore because it's too expensive. For the price of a three-year-old four-wheel drive big tractor like they have to have now, we could build nine of these for that price. I don't know how this is going to be today, how hot it's going to be in there because we just got it started and then, then they went to Australia for two weeks uh. and she wasn't used to watering. There she is watering. Yep. She's watering now. We just finished building it about two weeks ago. They're so much cheaper than a conventional greenhouse. We tell people if they have access to a backhoe and can do their own labor, which is easy because it just all slips together. It took two of us six hours to put the frame up. We tell people they can put one up completely automated for less than 25,000. What they would put for the heat system in a regular greenhouse. That nozzle works pretty good, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. This one I can water pretty fast. Yeah. How long has it been up? A short time. About less than three weeks for the plants. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. 
and they yeah, took a shock when we first put them in. They did, yeah, yeah. they did, big time. But they're doing really well now. Yeah. They're yeah. really starting to go. And these up here, I can't believe how much they've they, grown. Yeah. So do you want to have, is this sort of a backyard garden idea as well, to have your own produce? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and experimenting. Mm -hmm. Boy, these things are really taking off, haven't they? Yeah, they're really starting to go. Yeah. They're really... Because that's faster than... Wouldn't that be faster than just in the ground outside? Yeah, yeah. I've planted some outside to experiment to see yeah. which ones have done the best. And these are way, way ahead of the ones outside. That's the geothermal tubes. They go 75 foot out, 75 foot across, and 75 foot back into the other end. So you've got 230 feet of tube eight foot deep. At that length of tube, we found that we'll have enough length in the ground to pick up the whole 52 degrees. It's stable at 52 degrees here. Uh, some places it's down to 48, 49. Some places, like the one up at Blackhawk, it's 62 because they're next to some warm springs. So if you have a stable temperature, you can use that both in winter and summer? Yeah, we could use it for cooling now. That's what it's actually doing. I'll show you what, it, what that peak is now. Okay, it's 125 degrees. It's coming out at 87 degrees. So it's really circulating. See where that white box is at the other end? Uh -huh. That's where all the 17 tubes come up. And they just circulate through. But we're trying to figure out whether it works better to push, like this one's pushing, or pull air like this one is. So when we find that out, we'll we'll use whichever is the most e efficient. You've got two thermostats. One goes on when it hits 80 degrees, it'll go on for the cooling. When it drops to 50 degrees, it'll be for the warming in the winter. So you've got a 30 degree temperature range in there where there's no fans on at all. So you, you're not using any energy during that time in the winter. I was a straight D student, but the only th class that I really liked was physics. And a lot of this is nothing but high school physics. That's a model of the new type. See, our blower is at this end. Then the tubes come out here and they go anywhere outside 230 foot. And then they come up down in there. And so four of them would come in on this side. And then we've got two on this side. And those tubes, they go out eight foot deep, 83 feet. They come up right in this bucket here. Eventually it's gonna have a better lid on it. See there, this goes from here into that entry room and it has a blower and those are high pressure blowers. See this one is the one that has the underground tubes that will cool it in the winter. This room is completely isolated and closed. In the winter, when it gets hot in here, this blower comes on and if it's all closed, it causes a vacuum and it sucks this air underground and it's pre-cooled and then it'll go in here. Then we suck the air off of the peak, off of the peak. That tube takes that hot air off of the top here and it puts it in, it comes down and it's a foot deep underground here. Down about a foot deep along here, comes up and goes back in up there. And then the blower, it just blows back. It just recirculates that heat and puts it in the ground. So in the winter time, we store that amount of heat in the path. So we think we can delay the fans coming on a couple hours at night. This is gonna be a pond. It'll have 1,220 gallons of water in it and we'll put fish in it, we'll float lettuce on planks, then we'll water out of it, out of the pond because the fish will fertilize it. So aquaponics. So aquaponics. If we had the hydroponics set up, 
we could go clear to the, the end with a trough in here and have uh, this all hydroponics flowing from this end back into the uh, pond there. There's a lot of geothermal research going on, but it's most all of it's grant research, so the end product is millions of dollars. So it's not for a market grower like this. But your idea is that people could copy this or use this, your research and your creation? Yeah, we're, right now we're working with a company in Dubai, and they're interested in seeing from what we've learned if they could use it for cooling. At night, does it get uh, cold on the desert there? Yeah. Because at night you would be able to maybe put a little cool air through there. It might be that the tubes would need to be longer. I think there would be a way to use these underground tubes to ventilate the whole thing and not use any outside air. Everything is automated. That would be everything, the blowers and everything are on thermostats. We can monitor it all. If we had the right equipment, we could actually turn blowers on and off with the telephone. Mm -hmm. And how about pests? We don't have a pest problem at all. The only pests we have are white flies and aphids. And either one of those we can control with horticulture oil. All it is is a refined mineral oil. On a system like this, organic is the only sensible way to go. You can have locally grown organic for the same as you would have outside if you were using toxic chemicals. The local is, is really a bigger selling point than organic. In the sand hills, those towns are all drying up. All of these little towns that are drying up have vacant lots with water and power at the lot. And it only makes sense to put these in. One this size, like Cody, is 140 people. You could just about furnish fresh vegetables year round for a town that size on just this size. And then with citrus, you'd have even more. Yeah, I don't think he knows how old you are. No. Uh, 85. 85? Yeah. Wow. So. And you're still building. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> we, we were retired for several years and then it come to this. So. Do you expect to retire? Not as long as this, <laughs> as we've got this going. <laughs> so it's getting really interesting now.